everyone, and welcome to episode 87 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabolsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Well, I will admit to being utterly exhausted after moving the last of my very heavy furniture and mountains of books from one place to another this past weekend, but Peter Konechny from Medievalist.net really, really wanted you to still have a podcast episode this week. So he volunteered to come on and tell us about one of his favorite medieval biographies, that of Francesco Dottini, the Merchant of Prato. This is the story of a fairly ordinary 14th century Italian merchant who rises to the top, his unforgettable wife, and one of the richest document finds ever made. So without further ado, here's Peter to tell us all about the Merchant of Prato. All right, well, welcome back, Peter. You are here to tell us all about an Italian merchant who we know about through an unusual way. So let's hit it. Tell us about this guy and why he's important. All right. So there's this book called The Merchant of Prado. It was published in 1957, became really, really well known like uh, during his time. And it was like, people like, oh my gosh, this exists. And so the author was like, her, uh, the author kind of researched her was named Iris o- Otega, and uh, you know she was kind of this biographer, uh, has a very interesting life story herself. So, but she kind of comes across this archive, and I guess it was known among like Italian historians. But in the year 1870, uh, in Prato, they discovered basically under the, the a stairs, a staircase, all these boxes of letters and notes. And it turns out to be 150,000 letters and 500, like, book ledgers, so account books. Wow, that's crazy. So, like, this is a, the biggest treasure trove, like, that I think anyone's, like, ever come across from, like, a me- one medieval source. And it was just buried in the stairwell? Yeah, yeah. Basically, Francesco had left uh, in his will, like, little instructions. Yeah, keep my, my notes and records safe, right? Uh, and... We hear about them again, like the 16th century, but it seems at that point they were kind of forgotten in this little spot. So, so then 300 years later, it's like uh, I think it was literally there, you know, like oh, what's behind this door? <laughs> and, oh, oh my gosh, it's, you know. So and so people have been kind of researching it, and Merchant Prado comes out, and ever since then, like that's a book that I think a lot of medieval medievalists or people are interested in like Italian history or, you know, history of economics, things like that, you know, like they have to have that copy. So like I've had this copy, like, you know, you know, bouncing around, I've looked at it here and there and it's just, it's good. It's really surprising because it's, it's, so what we have is Francesco and he was like born in 1335. He, you know, has a kind of like a, a bit of a rough childhood because like uh, black death hits both his parents die, two of his uh, siblings die. Another family take, kind of takes care of him. So, But he's like, he's kind of on his own, right? He comes apprentice to be a, a merchant. And in 1358, so in the early 20s, he, he gets to go to Avignon and, and work as like a, basically a merchant there. And this is a time when the papacy has moved to Avignon. And so there's you know quite a lot of traffic, business traffic, especially you know, from Italy to France. So He's kind of based there, and he starts becoming uh, a merchant of basically a military arms dealer, more more like an armor dealer. Like, <laughs> so he, he doesn't sell too many weapons, but he is selling a lot of armor. And uh, this is during the Hundred Years' War, so business is good. Yeah. And so he's constantly kind of like, so that's his kind of early years is kind of like importing like all types of armor from. Italy, you know, take him across the Alps into France, uh, sells him off to the soldiers and things like that, or customers. And he gets uh, a bit of a following, like, it spends about almost another 20 years, basically, in Avignon, kind of building up a little business, making connections, things like that. He, in 1376, he marries a, a lady named Margarita Bandini, and she is like, and he, at this time, he's in his 40s, she's about 15. Hmm. So it's uh, she's from a family that were like kind of a bit of nobility, but they had kind of fallen on rough political times, which led to her her father getting executed. Oof, that is rough. So she's got like this kind of family that's kind of you know a little proud, but at the same time you know a bunch of grifters. (laughs) 
Wow. <laughs> that's very kind of you. Hey, that's what she says. So. Oh, okay. And uh, so they kind of marry and they move back to Prado. And that's where he kind of, he's, he's kind of starting his business. And like, so like in the business side, you know, we have all these kind of records dealing with like all his business interests and they kind of, he kind of expands. So he's a guy that he kind of comes from nothing and becomes basically what we call a millionaire. I would say by the time of his death, he has uh, like 70,000 florins, you know, wow. so. So he does well. Like he's he's basically uh, he's from Prato. He kind of sets up a network of like like he hires a bunch of people. So they're staffing places. Like he's got like offices in Florence, Pisa, Genoa, Barcelona, Valencia, Mallorca, Ibiza, Avignon. You know, so he's doing a basically importing exporting kind of business. Uh, so you get uh, he's doing English wool from London is coming in, oranges from Catalonia. Copper from Africa goes you know, through the Balearic Islands to him. And he's also selling like, like works of art. So, so it was like, you know, like basically uh, some of his clients are like the, you know, bishops in Avignon. So yeah, he's finding like wonderful ways. Like, so you get like lots of things like that. You know, funny thing, uh, he, the very first mention of ravioli. <laughs> is in now, his if that's not worth a podcast, I don't know what it is. So the first mention of ravioli, what? He has in his records. So that's the first time you ever hear the word ravioli is like this food. Uh, so yeah, like I can imagine like, you know, if people can spend like tons and tons of time going through his like trade networks and stuff like that. But the best parts are really his correspondence with his wife. And that's because like, so there are like, so there's hundreds of letters back and forth between the two of them. And it's it's because he's spending most of his time outside of Prato. He's like, he's usually like uh, either traveling or he's in Florence, which is like a day's journey away, but he's in Florence or he's like, he's often doing stuff. So they're kind of corresponding. And sometimes it's, you know, every day, you know, we like, we have records like, um, of, you know, you hear, you know, what happened yesterday, you know, what, what's going on tomorrow, things like that. And it alone is this fascinating collection. Because you really like, this is a very interesting couple. So yeah, he's like 20, 25 years her senior, right? And like from his, the early kind of says like, oh, what a you know, wonderful wife she is, you know, and like, and like, oh, she's meek and stuff like that. But by the time we get to see this correspondence, oh, they, they have these wonderful conversations, which when I mean that they are arguing and bickering at each other. <laughs> And like, she, you know, she doesn't quite like, uh, he, she doesn't quite like the tone sometimes he has with her. Like, he's always like, oh, do this, do that, you know, any very minute de details like, oh, you know, make sure the donkey has enough water to drink and take that water from here, you know, like, and so. <laughs> Micromanager. Indeed, indeed. And like, sometimes she doesn't, you know, like, she does not care for these things. So, <laughs> you know, so like, there is like, you know, there's one time where he, he kind of compliments her, uh, the the letter, and says, oh, you must have had someone write it for you. Uh, yeah. You didn't write it on your own. Ah, she, she's not, you know, you know, uh, so she, surprised, you know, she says, you know, you told me in your two letters, and the one you wrote to Piero, that I cannot have composed those letters myself, but that Piero de Filipino must have composed them. Excuse me, but he never composes my letters neither he nor anyone else you very much underestimate me in thinking i would get to him to compose my letters if i don't have simone i go to nicolo de amanto who seems to be more suitable than piero de filipino or else to lorenzo only of those two would i reveal my secrets to no one else francesco i acknowledge that i have written to you too freely and you have demonstrated too much independence from you in telling you the truth if you were beside me i would not have spoken so boldly slap me in the eyes or in the head whatever you will i don't care i will speak the truth as i know it i have said nothing to you that i have already said at least once a month here perhaps i don't speak so directly and although i do things that make you swell with anger 12 times a day i may have, have a bit of gabarity tongue not that i'm proud of that I cannot work out yours. I don't know what need there was for you to write to Piero. You have upset me greatly. 
And it's not the first time. It seems, <laughs> to me, it seems to me you wanted to clarify this matter. You should have waited for my answer because according to the women who found me slightly dishonest, a little fond of pleasure, and a bit too friendly for their friars, I have been <laughs> with you now for 10 years, and I have spoken with them twice a year at most. And from now on, I will have nothing to do with them. I don't collect godmothers and godfathers of every sort like you do. So you are well ahead of me there. I'm not going to give you excuse anymore. <laughs> this is not the past in letters, is it? <laughs> no, no. And it was funny, like, it's just like a couple paragraphs later, like she's giving him advice on like, you know, who to hire and, uh, you know, oh, and this person's not doing a good a job and oh, so. It's just a reminder, everyone should burn their letters or <laughs> delete their emails before history finds yeah. them. <laughs> like, like, I'm just kind of thinking, like, the, you know, the hundreds of thousands, like, we have, like, 150,000 letters, mostly by uh, Francesco. He is writing all the time. Like, this, this kind of covers, like, a, you know, 30, 40 year period. So, you know, it's, you know, we're looking at, like, a dozen letters a day, at least. So, and, uh, you know, he's very much a workaholic. And she upbraids him for that, too. You know, like, you know, it's like, you know, oh, you know, you know, you send me messages telling me to be happy and to enjoy myself. But you stay awake until morning and dine at midnight and lunch at sunset. I will not be happy and I'll never be uh, to rest if you don't live differently. <laughs> so. So, yeah, you've got like uh, this kind of and it's, it's an interesting dynamic. Now, when uh, like there's other little factors, like one thing is they're never able to have children together. And this is something that's kind of can can be seen a little under the surface. You know, like at one point, you know, like, you know, she kind of, you know, you know Bill a bit melancholic about it. He also has children with other women. Hmm. So illegitimate, uh, including like slaves that they own. So like it, there's one case where there's a boy that dies like uh, like in childbirth. And he buries the, this boy in his tomb, so at the foot of his tomb. Oh, yeah. uh, and then, uh, you know, a few years later, they have him and another one of it, like the slave uh, saves that he has a woman. And it was, she was like, her name is Lucia. They have a child, and her name is Genereva. And it seems like for the first little while, Margarita does not want anything to do with this, this girl. She's kind of sent off. But when around the age of six, it all changes. And she like, I'm, you know, we're going to bring Geneva in. And, I, and she literally says, I'm going to treat her like my own daughter. Hmm. And they, and she's like, you know, like they're, they're basically their child. At this point, the slave has gotten married off to somebody else has been freed and married off. So, you know, like interesting. It's a fascinating kind of world, right? Like, you know, where you have, you know, like servants and slaves and they're hiring more. Like they're like, this is, you know, they've, he's freeing slaves. You know, after a few years, it seems like it. Or in some cases, you know, if they get, he gets into this trouble. So, yeah. but Geneva is treated like their daughter. And like, there's even like a fun little bit where Francesco sends off one of his men to Florence. So he could go buy a, a tambourine for her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a and cute story. And when she has the wedding, like when he eventually, they eventually, you know, marry her off, it's like the biggest wedding ever seen in Prato so <laughs> but so you have that dynamic uh you have you know basically you know a lot of you know there's times when they're very angry with each other uh Obviously. Like, you know uh yeah like you know like she seems to you know there are times when she's like upset about his extramarital affairs but at the same time there's other parts where she seems to have accepted it and, you know, it's like she wants to be with him, right? Like, that's like, you know, he, he says, like, you know, one day I'm going to just come to you. You know, mm -hmm. you're way off there. You're in Venice. I'm just going to come to Venice, whether you like it or not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I mean, that kind of illustrates the fact that people's relationships will change over time. You know, <laughs> like, it's, it's not like your emotions are fixed even from day to day. These letters yeah. show, you know. For, and, and, for wives at the time, there's a lot of infidelity, but that doesn't mean that every day. It's going to be the same in how you feel about it, I think. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, at, at times, like she says, like, you know, the people around town, you know, like they you know there's rumors and there's gossip and I hate it. You know, and there's like she had like another time she says, like, you know, I can't bring anybody over to our house. 
you know, because they'll just say stuff. So because you're not there. But you see a relationship that, between the two where she gradually, be, you know, gets more and more authority, I guess. Like, you know, she basically runs the house while he's gone. But as he gets older, like she kind of takes more and more charge of things. Yeah. Like, yeah. She, that's not really unusual for a medieval wife to really be involved, not only in the household, but also in the business, especially when her husband's away. Like, yeah, she's like, she's like, she learns to read and write. Yeah. So. <laughs> Either that or she gets someone to write for her, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you know, like it was, it was this, you know, like this correspondent, like, you know, at first she's dictating letters, right? And like, there's like, there's kind of conversations about that. You know, there's funny there's one part like the uh, one of the notaries uh, says to Francesco, race of Francesco, you know, I read uh, the letters to, to your wife, but I always leave out the jokes, the male jokes that we say. So I can't <laughs> tell her those. <laughs> oh, great. So that's probably why she learned how to read. So she wouldn't miss the jokes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so but like is she, uh, you know, and like there's there's interesting talks about like how difficult at times she has like reading and writing just you know it's like she gets she learns through like the you know uh you know religious texts so like she finds the business stuff a lot harder so yeah but margarita so we have you know so it's like a fascinating like dynamic between those two and like you get uh it's been actually well only fairly recently that like the letters of margarita has been translated to english and published so there's, a, I think, about 250 50 of them. And they're not just Francesca, but also to her family, to, like, friends and family members. The, her family, you know, they, they come begging for money a lot. So, yeah. so at that point, she says, like, you know, you're, you're dead to me, you know, to one of them. So. Yeah, well, I was thinking about how this is a whole lot of parchment to hold on to because, I mean, obviously, they're rich beyond belief. But I mean, they're not reusing their parchments by scraping off, you know, a, la a layer and writing it, writing on it again. So this is kind of a really, a real rich person's thing to keep all your parchment and not reuse it. The, I think like this is like Fran uh, Francesco Dettini is a bit, you know, ahead of the curve, ahead of his times, because, you know, there's a lot of Italian merchants were kind of keeping records and keeping notes. But he's like, he certainly just exceeds them all right and just like keeping track and he's such a prolific writer hmm. like people you know like as margarita complains like he is you know writing all day you know that and he's he's such a guy that he can't let things you know pass right so you know uh so it, it is fascinating and then you you like, have you have other kind of letters like you have wonders like a friend of his you know his name is uh lapo mezzi and he's like this He's in Prato. He's just this notary. You know, he's about 15 years younger. And he's like friends. He's like a family friend. And, you know, he, he kind of is like the uh, good angel on Francisco's <laughs> shoulder, right? Trying to kind of give him a, like a, a, a calmer path. Like, you know, like, because he worries that Francesco is just working himself, A, you know, like to death. But also, like, he's like missing out on the big picture. Like, he says once, like, he, You've got a rough soul and frozen heart. You know? <laughs> he's like Ebenezer yeah, Scrooge. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it's this, this is wonderful. He's the one that teaches Margarita to read as well. He calls her, her his disciple. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I bet so, she loves that. <laughs> but, you know, we, it's just like these wonderful kind of, of conversations that they're having. And, you know, it's, I guess, like, you know, it's not a time like we don't live in a time where people write like long letters and like discuss these things. Like, you know, we just kind of email and everything's quick, quick and dirty kind of like, you know, message here, message that. So it's like fascinating to see sometimes like they sometimes tell tales to each other like, oh, here's here's this tale I heard, you know, uh, mm -hmm. so like, of, of, of the Roman emperor, blah, 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 you know, so. Yeah, well, we also have phones, right? So if we wanted yeah, to tell a story, yeah. we wouldn't necessarily have to write it. But in the Middle Ages, you want to tell a story that you heard, you have to write it down and mail it. So Lapo is, you know, like, he's that one guy, like, he's a friend, but he's not. He doesn't want to use his friendship to get ahead. Like, you know, he'll, he'll share, like, you know, if there's dinner, he'll come over for dinner, have a nice wine. 
But like, yeah, don't give me, you know, don't give me money. Don't give me stuff. Like he once tells, you know, Francesco, like you've sent me all this cheese. I'm going to become a cheesemonger, you know, so <laughs> stop it, you know. <laughs> so Francesco's not all bad. He sounds like he's generous a little bit. And I, I was skimming a little bit of his bio, not a lot, but. Was he, did he end up being a philanthropist at the end too? Didn't he will a whole bunch of stuff to charity basically? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically, uh, when he dies in 1410, like he doesn't have any legitimate heirs. He's married off his daughter. And so he decides, you know, like, yeah, I'm going to leave it to the city of Florence as well as his house. So in the city. And that becomes this kind of, I think, like a, like a basically fund for the poor. Hmm. And, you know, it's still something that's really recognized. Like there is like, you know, a bust of, of Francesco, like in, in Prato, there's his tomb in the city, you know, like, so it, he's, he's been like, he is revered, I think, in Prato as like this kind of, you know, philanthropist and good guy. But like deep down, like, you know, he, he comes across his personality is one of this, like, I'm just, I'm working, I'm doing my thing. I'm, I want to make more money because I want to make more money to make more money, right? Like one of those person, like, and you know, it doesn't make him happy, right? Like he says, like there's there's one point he says, you know, destiny has ordained that from the day of my birth I should never know a, a, a whole happy day. Wow, that's yeah. dark. Yeah. So he like he's basically wor he's worrying about his business, like. Oh, will the ships come in or, not, or will they, you know, you know, crash, you know, will the business deal go through, you know, what will happen? Will my, are my workers doing a good job? Yeah. So my wife is nagging me. Hey, hey, it sounds like he's nagging her even more. <laughs> you know, now, like, at this time, this is a really political time for Italy in yeah. terms of city states and stuff. So was he ever interested in politics, tried to get into politics or he just kind of stayed out of that? He he stays out of that. Like he he's certainly not one of the like he's he's a rich guy, but he's not like super wealthy, right? And he's just trying to kind of like he's someone trying to make a business, but he is he does get caught up in events. Like when the plague comes, you know, he has him and his family, you know, hightail it to Bologna to you know to get out of the when of that. A year ago, or so I did a piece uh, talking about when a mercenary army looks like they're going to come to Prato. And like, he's like, oh, these, you know, he's like, you know, this army is just going to loot everything. So like he sends off like instructions to Margarita. All right, we got to like, we have our villa outside of town. You got to get everything out of that villa, you know, strip it down like of like every little piece because they're going to come and destroy it if they if they get there. And like, so we have like this correspondence between her and him. Like, yeah, I'm, you know, I've got the guys working. We're tearing it down. We're going to take down the bridge last. You know, there's a couple guys that said they're going to stay there and like they're not going to move. And the other guy, like one guy's going to get is going to stay there until like the crossbows. He's in crossbow range and he's going to flee. <laughs> so, Aww. and yeah, they're able to and like he's at the same time. Oh, make sure you like give out all the money and bread, you know, as you can, you know, like be generous right now because, you know, we could need friends. Right. So smart. And uh yeah, yeah, and like, fortunately, the, the 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 mercenary army veers off before they get to Prato, and like, he's like, and he's in Florence, by the way. He says, "Oh, you know, you did a great job, Margarita. I, I'm really proud of you." And by the way, send me like all the flour you can because right now there's no flour in Florence, so there, it's it's a it's a seller's market. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a a bit yeah. of a an opportunistic type letter. It is, yeah. So it's it's this, yeah. You have a, they're fat. They're all both fascinating characters. This fascinating kind of family dynamics. You know, there's, you know, it, even like the interesting part. Like they, they have kind of, they own all these kind of, not a lot of slaves, but they do own slaves. And you know, there's, you know, one part, you know, where uh, one of them, you know, he, he gets manumitted, but he still works for Francesco, and you know, and then he like. He's working, and Francesco, like, wanted him to take care of a mule, but he didn't do it properly. And he said, like, you know, I upbraided him, and then he says, you know, you know, if I'm treated like this, you know, uh, this guy was complaining, and he took his leave, and he said he would not work with me. He'd rather eat grass than work for me. And he <laughs> leaves. <laughs> and so he says, like, he just complains to his wife, you know, like, Ah, you know, I freed this numbskull from slavery. This is my gratitude. 
It's hard to find good help these days, even when you lift them up from slavery, I suppose. Yes. Thanks. I was going to say, you said that the person who translated and compiled these letters had an interesting life story, too. What was that? Yeah, Iris uh, Origa is like an English lady, goes to live in Italy, like in the 1920s. She starts writing biographies. When World War II happens, she joins like the Freedom uh, Resistance. Wow. So she's actually, you know, uh, helping, you know, people uh, escape the Nazis. Hmm. So, you know, and then like, yeah, she kind of has this, you know, history of, uh, of writing, uh, writing biography, right? And uh, like dozens, right? And this is obviously this is the Merchant of Prado is like her most famous work. But uh, uh, she was really, uh, it seems like a, quite a person herself. So, and, you know, the book, it, it, it took off. And ever since then, like, there's a lot of people have been doing like research on it because there's so much you could do. Right. Uh, I think like Margaret, the, the story of Margarita, which, which Iris tells a bit, like there's like a chapter about like the family, but there's so much more to tell that like, we've had uh, a lot of, uh, you know, like research on that in recent years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So histories upon histories. So what's the edition that you're using that you, oh, that you were reading? Basically I'm doing the, uh, it's from Penguin Books version, which was from like uh, this one, like a 1979 copy. So I got it, like used bookstore, but like the original is from you know, 1957. So yeah. Uh, so you can you can literally there's it, this should be something you could be able to pick up at a used bookstore. Um, lots of libraries will will have it. Uh, it. It's it's not it's not a you know fairly thick book. It's only only about you know 350 pages. So is it. Uh, mostly a biography, or is it mostly compiled letters? Mostly a biography. Like the, 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 there'll be a little kind of snippet. Uh, Iris says, like you know, French. I don't put all of Francesco's writings. Like I don't put a, an entire letter because he tends to repeat himself when giving orders. So <laughs> you'll say. So she didn't like that. So like, uh, so yeah, there's all all sorts of like little snippets and like here's a little bit of daily life. You know, here's things that like they observe. Just he, he, come in going. Um, sometimes she gets into like you know what it was like in Prato itself. So yeah, so it's like a one like it's, it's a, I think like it's one of those books about daily life that you know and that is just a pleasure to read. Those are my favorite kind. Well, I'm awfully glad that you came on to tell us about that. So thank you. That's the Merchant of Prato, right? That's right. Awesome. So what's going on on the website these days? Oh, okay. So uh, we have some details on a new online course. It's called A Taste of Christmas Past. It's brought to you by people at University of Durham University. They've been kind of already kind of doing these courses about food. And this is a three-day course on teaching how to make a medieval Christmas dinner. Wow. So does that mean goose, you think? Probably, right? <laughs> or is that a Dickens thing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking the wrong person, aren't I? I co food cooking? Like, <laughs> That's I, true. I hope someone they didn't have microwaves back in the day. <laughs> You'd be lost. What else is going on on the website then? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you can check out that. You can check out a piece on genetics of the Mongol Empire. And we also take a look at this, the recent, like, Armenia-Azerbaijani war and how that's, like, might uh, affect medieval sites in Nagorno-Karabakh. So we've got that. And, uh, you know, just uh, the other podcasts are rolling in as well, so... Uh, check those out, uh, uh, Byzantium and Friends and Sc uh, Scottish Chronicast. So. That's awesome. All sorts of new stuff every week on Medievalist.net, yeah? All right, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thanks for being a guest on the show again. Thanks. Next week is the 900th anniversary of the White Ship Disaster, an event that changed the course of the English monarchy and European history forever. To commemorate the event, I'll be speaking with Charles Spencer over on his Instagram page on November 25th at 6.30 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. You can follow Charles' Instagram account to catch the live stream at cspencer1508. Or you can follow me at 5min medievalist to catch the live stream. Charles' book on the disaster is just called The White Ship, and it's good. I've enjoyed it. So I hope to virtually see you there. The other thing I wanted to tell you about is that I'm gearing up to open registration for the January session of the Medieval Masterclass. So tune in next week for information about how to sign up and how to get a discount on your registration fee.
And now it's time to say thank you, as always, to our patrons on patreon.com. Your support is what keeps this podcast going through thick and through thin. So if you love the podcast, why not visit our Patreon page to find everything from subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, or our book club, or our exclusive maps by Tina Ross. If, unlike me, you're actually getting organized around holiday gifts, maybe there's someone on your list who might be interested in some of our goodies. You can find all the action at patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from merchants to maritime disasters, follow medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at medievalists. You can follow me, Danielle Sabelski, on social media at 5min medievalist or 5 minute medievalist and you really do want to follow me on Instagram by next week. You can find my books including Life in Medieval Europe Fact and Fiction at your favorite online bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening and have yourself an awesome day. <laughs>